All right, this is going to be a video response to a video by Michael Shermer titled Mass Public Shootings and Gun Violence Part 1, a video that was posted last November. And I know that you can't actually do a video response, but um, I saw this video, it came up in the sidebar, and I've watched Michael Shermer on the Joe Rogan Show a couple times, and I like him. Uh, he seems fairly reasonable, and this video seemed sincere and fairly intellectually honest as far as I think his motivations went. Uh, but I think it's a good video to respond to because it makes some of the most basic uh, anti-gun arguments. And I think although he does these sincerely, he makes the same basic errors that are often made. So the video that he made, and I'll put a link in the description if you want to watch it, um, was kind of divided into two parts. The first part, he dealt very, very briefly with the idea of using guns in self-defense. And he cited two studies which basically are used to show, well, people don't use them in self-defense as much as they uh, are victimized by guns. And uh, the first study was uh, the Kellerman study. And the Kellerman study is famous or infamous, depending on how you look on its study. And I've talked about it before. I have a whole video titled The Kellerman Study. Um, the problem with this study is it measured how many times people either killed or wounded an assailant with a gun and then looked at how many times uh, people were victimized who owned guns. And the problem there is that it underreports the defensive uses of guns. If you are attacked by someone and you pull out your gun and you say, get the fuck away or I'll shoot you, and the, the, the attacker runs away, that's clearly a defensive gun use, but that wouldn't count because you didn't injure or kill your assailant. Um, the same would be true if you fired a warning shot or if you fired and missed. And you might argue, well, so that's just some, some fraction of them. Well, it's actually probably the super majority of defensive gun uses. There's a whole other issue of how often people use defensive gun uses, or people use guns defensively in the United States, which is a slight, is not something that Kellerman was attempting to study. Um, there's a couple, well, there's quite a few, there's 20 or 30 different uh, estimates that have been given, but the numbers run the, the very minimum, right? And these are numbers that I don't agree with, but the, the lowest level, the lowest number of um, uh, estimates are, you know, 50 to 75,000. That's the absolute, like the most anti-gun uh, and that study is anomalous. Most of them put it closer to the million range. But let's say, just for the sake of argument, and I might do a whole video just about that that question, that's how many happen. Well, we don't have 50,000 defensive gun homicides or defensive gun in, uh, injuries. So there's a high, high proportion of defensive gun uses that don't result in the attacker being injured or killed. So they're radically undercounting probably by in the area of 90 plus percent i think probably more in the area of 99 percent but you know in, any even even a marginal uh increase in the number of defensive gun uses would obliterate the data the other thing is there isn't a causal link necessarily between having the gun and then being victimized that's another problem with these studies um, in fact, some of them don't even, the implication is a lot of people will kind of misquote these studies. That's not what the studies claim, but a lot of people walk away saying, oh, if you have a gun in the house, it's more likely to be used against you than a, an assailant. Um, I think that's true in the sense of suicide. If you're going to commit suicide, you know, and more people commit suicide than are murdered, but there isn't a link saying that the gun actually makes you commit suicide. Um, but it doesn't make you more likely to be victimized. The people who get, when, when the people were victimized, it wasn't their own gun that did it. Sometimes they were not even shot. They were stabbed or they were beat up or they were shot by an assailant's weapon, in which case it's hard to see how you having had a gun made that more likely. Anyway, that's the first part of his video and that's not the main thing I want to talk about. Uh, the, that, that kind of problem in these studies though, where they, where they don't count, um, uh, defensive gun uses that involve non-lethal force or non-shooting the victim is 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 a consistent problem and I it might just be a result of it's hard for them methodologically speaking to do a study because then they would have to try and estimate the number of incidents that happened that maybe weren't reported or it's an actual disingenuous attempt to underrate the defensive uh, uses of guns I'll make another video just about that but
The second part of his video, he talked about um, defense against tyranny. And it's interesting because the title of the video is public ma Mass Public Shootings and Gun Violence, and he never really talks about mass public shootings at all. And it says part one, and I've never seen part two, so I don't know if they're just not going to get around to that or what. But he talks about you know, the, the Second Amendment applying to a defense against tyranny, and then goes on to say, well, look, it's the, that might have been true in, in the 18th century, but it's not true now. Uh, and I've seen this this kind of graphic repeatedly. And then they show like the silhouettes of they say, well, if you have a semi-automatic rifle and you know you have body armor, um, it's delusional to think that you can oppose the the government. And then they show all these silhouettes of various weaponry tanks, helicopters, jets, and then and I've seen this repeatedly uh, a nuclear submarine. And I'm just I always wonder, like, is, is, is the inference there that the nuclear submarine is going to torpedo me or that it's going to launch inter intercontinental ballistic missiles and, like, nuke the place where the people are, are rebelling? Like, that, that's never really been clear to me. And I think it's, it's illustrating um, a real basic uh, misunderstanding about what would be involved in, a, in an insurrection. And I'll, I'll say, I agree, like, if we're talking about an insurrection where it's just one person or ten people or a hundred people, yes, the disparity of forces is tremendous, uh, and there's very, very low likelihood of that ever succeeding or, or going well. That almost certainly end very badly for everyone. Um, but it, what's the basis for predicating uh, insurrection as being only a only hundred people or uh, uh, one person? Right, he the video at no point addresses well. What if there was an insurrection and involved you know 10 million people or 5 million people? We have uh, 82 million gun owners, you know. Uh, so if one percent of them rebelled, that would be 820,000 people. Um, that's a lot of people. That's not so easy to dismiss as saying, well, the Navy SEALs are going to show up at your door. Yeah, if it was just me that's totally plausible and that's a big problem if there was a million people there aren't that many navy seals um now i'm not saying i favor this or i think it's a good idea i'm not saying that uh insurrection is is something that i want or is particularly likely but how 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 plausible a, a rebellion is is dependent on the circumstances of that rebellion all right if we have a rebellion where half the states secede you can't just say that that's impossible or that could never succeed. There's there's a good chance that it might. If we're talking about 1% of the population or 10%, these are big differences. Um, when we're talking about warfare, it's not simply the side that has the most firepower that automatically wins. That's not if, if you have, there's political factors involved of who has the most will to survive, who has the most, you know, we've had Vietnam, we've had Afghanistan now. I think it, it's becoming... It's, it's pretty historically clear that, like, just because you have the most technology and the most infrastructure and the most military capital doesn't mean you automatically win. And the potential for the United States to resist is, is much higher. The United States is a much bigger country with much, many more people. Um, the politicians waging the war on the civilians would be more vulnerable than they are to, say, Vietnamese or, you know, uh, Afghanistan. So... Again, it's circumstance. There's plenty of circumstances I can imagine where insurrection would not work or would be very, very uh, unlikely to be effective. And then I can also imagine scenarios where it is. And I, I don't want to lay odds on any of those scenarios. But I think it's you're not being fair to the argument if you're just going to predicate. Well, what if the insurrection is only like you and your buddies? Well, yeah, of course that's not going to work. But what are what what kind of? And then and then he goes on to say if if you have problems with the government, you should get a lawyer. Well, like, I agree with that if, like, we're just talking about problems, but the point of the Second Amendment isn't, like, you have a personal beef with, with the government. The problem, the, the Second Amendment is dealing with the idea of a tyrannical despotism. Okay, in a tyrannical despotism, lawyering up is not going to be effective, all right? I, I don't, I don't, even though the Second Amendment anticipates the 20th century, that was, it was made with the idea of somebody like Mao, or Stalin, or Hitler, or Pol Pot, or, or Fidel Castro, or any number of other people we could name here, and it's just, it's like a, it's, it's like a bad joke to say, oh, if Hitler, like, if the only, if only the Jews had lawyered up, 
you know, that could have stopped Hitler. Uh, no, that would have done nothing for Hitler. That would, absolutely, those six million Jews would have been better off with shotguns. That would have been better. At least they could have killed some of their tormentors as they went down. And there's a chance they could have prevented it from happening. Or some of them could have, and some of them did. I mean, there were, there are these, uh, the, and to be sure, small cases, ex exceptional cases, or whether it be in the Warsaw Ghetto and some other places in Eastern Europe where partisans were able to escape and 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 not to resist, but also to survive. And surviving is the, the more important of the two. Um, you know, and the same for China, same for the Soviet Union. Um, I'll, I'll say, you know, in my research of, of the, there's some uh, biography on Stalin back there that the, um, the, the the peasants' ability to to resist um, the agents of the state was quite important, and it was slowly degraded over the course of of um, Bolshevik rule. So, uh, by the time of the 30s, the population had been significantly disarmed, and they had to resist with farm implements instead of. And, and, and this is what I don't understand. You, you can make the argument that while AR-15s and, and whatnot are, are maybe not the most effective things or not terribly effective against tanks, fair, but they're more effective than rakes or um, shovels or picks. Uh, and it, it's it's like if, you, if you're going to have a population that's going to be victimized by a tyranny, it's not like the scenario is identical if you go from a completely unarmed populace to a populace that's armed with swords, to a populace that's armed with bows and arrows, to a populace that's armed with single shot revolver or single shot, you know, rifles and shotguns, to ones that are armed with pump action and semi-automatic and so on and so forth. Those are all different scenarios. And the better the armament, the higher the deterrent. And here's the other thing about deterrence that I think a lot of anti-gun people are, are don't understand. And I, I think that most anti-gun people just hate guns and they hate the idea of people owning guns it bothers them they, they're hoplophobes and they don't want to just say that's why they don't like guns uh, so they think of they think of reasons that sound plausible as to why they shouldn't be allowed or why the justifications for guns are not good and then they just list those reasons and don't really examine those reasons very closely um, deterrence don't have to kill the attacker to be deterrence and I think the best analogy here is, is found in nature and that would be the porcupine the symbol of the Free State Project okay porcupines quills are not going to be able to kill a lion or a bear or it's very very unlikely it, 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 I mean you could do they get infected you know they they get a quill in their paw and they get infected and they starve sure sure that's possible but a, a porcupine is not going to kill a lion or a bear outright but because it has quills, because those quills can inflict damage, some damage, pain, annoyance, however you want to characterize it, then it's less likely that those animals are going to attack the porcupine. And for someone to then come and say, listen, porcupine, your, your quills couldn't kill your predators, so you just shouldn't have quills. We should cut them off because they're dangerous to other porcupines. Uh, that's fucking retarded. That defeats the entire purpose, and now the porcupine is vulnerable in a fundamental way that it wasn't before. So, having a a well armed populace is a deterrent. Doesn't mean that you can't have tyranny. Doesn't mean that you can't have oppression. That doesn't mean you can't have abuses. No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that it's a little bit harder, or maybe a lot harder, depending on what it is. And and you know the the converse of the argument here also is like, well, you're your rifles are not uh, sufficient to fight the military. That isn't an argument to abolish rifles. That is more an argument to liberalize access to other types of military equipment, as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, so yeah, it, you don't want to take the quills off a porcupine. You don't want to you know, remove the ability of the populace to be armed. And, and I've seen this question, it wasn't in the Shermer video, uh, but people say why why is it why do we allow 18 year olds to walk in and buy let's say um, assault weapons uh, that of course that doesn't mean anything but let's say semi-automatic black military style, style rifles why why should we allow 18 year olds to do that uh, because if we allow 18 year olds to do that if there's easy access if there's no registration if there's no restriction then the chances that the society that he lives in are going to end up in a gulag or a concentration camp are much reduced or, or hacked to death 
by the minority population in Rwanda or whatever it is. Um, makes that and, and, and people want to dismiss that possibility as, as somehow um, impossible or irrelevant. It's not. I mean, we had multiple examples in the 20th century. We have examples today even. Uh, and there's no logical reason why that can't happen in the United States. Democracy is not a magical shield here. It, it's, not, it's not invulnerable to manipulation, to demagoguery. Um, and, and the same, I mean, lawyers, like, governments legislate, they create law. So once somebody bad takes over the government, they can legislate a new morality that will allow whatever they do. And in the case of the United States, you know, say, well, we have checks and balances. Uh, these checks and balances might be somewhat effective, but they're not completely safe. Um, you know, the president appoints the, um, appoints the people on the Supreme Court. And also, we've had numerous cases where the Supreme Court has told the president that what they were doing was wrong and unconstitutional, and they were just ignored. Uh, Andrew Jackson did that, and so did Abraham Lincoln, to name two. Um, so there's no there's no safeguard. The, the government can't safeguard itself. There There isn't a night watchman state, you know, and I'm not a minarchist. But the, the one thing that would make minarchism work is if you actually had an independent um, power outside the government, basically in the citizenry, that could balance out the power of the, of the state. And that seems to be pretty clearly what was intended with the Second Amendment. That act, that's not just a hypothetical, I'm a pro-gun person, wouldn't that be nice? That seems to be what actually we have. Uh, and there's good reasons for that. So, uh, it... it uh, I've, I've talked about the silhouette issue before. It's kind of like when they they want to show how how implausible resisting the government is, so they stack up all these you know oh submarines and tanks and aircraft carriers, and it's like what how how most of the military's capital, most of it not maybe not most, but some large fraction of it would not be useful in a insurrection. And the question is. Would they abandon all the military bases around the world to suppress an insurrection, right? But, like, there's evidence that even right now, the fact that there are so many gun owners is preventing the government from, say, confiscating or banning guns, because they know that that will not happen. They know that that can't happen. And the, the reason it can't happen is not because of the NRA or because of some uh, Second Amendment uh, legal defense fund or... Anything like that. the reason that it can't happen is because there's 82 million fucking gun owners, and some fraction of them, and we don't know how many, are not going to give them up, not without a fight. And you know, if it's one tenth of one percent, that's not a big problem. If it's if it's 10 percent, that's a fucking huge problem. Uh, and the thing is, we we just don't know. And I think it it it's situation. It depends on the circumstances, right? I can't we can't predict now what it would be. Um, so. Yeah, I think that these these arguments are 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 pretty fallacious to say that we should be defenseless, that we should just trust the government and and just assume that they will never go bad, that they can't, that the democracy is a magic palliative that renders the state harmless and benevolent forever, that we can rely on lawyers. Again, I just find this so like yes, who people should have just if only they had known to sue Stalin and Lenin, that so much could have been prevented. It's so clear now. I like. I, I don't. Shermer is a smart guy, and is and I think a sincere guy. How could you say something so completely asinine? And there's also the moral question: whether it's futile or not. Shouldn't you have the? Shouldn't you have the right to go down swinging to to lash out at your oppressors? Oppressors. Why? What the the pro gun control argument is that there's I I think two. One is that. You just assume the government can't possibly be tyrannical, uh, and there are people like philosophically who think that whatever the government does is right. So no matter what it's doing, even if it was throwing in people in concentration camps, that's just syllogistically not tyrannical because whatever the government does is morally right. But most people don't explicitly say that, although many arguments do kind of boil down to that that dichotomy. Um, but yeah, it's. that they 
the minute that we could prove that it can't be tyrannical, then I would have, you know, a reason to not support the Second Amendment. But there, there's just no way. And I, I saw this in a comment, I think, on his video. Someone said, look, the only way these pro-gun people are ever going to, you know, give up the idea of a Second Amendment is if you, they could prove that the government couldn't possibly become tyrannical. And that's just not plausible. There's no way to be able to safely assume that. Um, and there, there are... There is some nuance that could be had here because you could make the argument, well, sure, it's a defense against tyranny, but there's a social cost, and that social cost is school shootings and higher homicide rates and blah, 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 and so that cost is too high. But I actually have never seen, I don't want to say never, it's very rare that that level of nuance is ever brought into the debate. And that's that's an interesting place to go. Um you know, and and I think there's some fallacies in that. For instance, I don't think that allowing people to own guns necessarily entails that you have a high homicide rate or that you have mass shootings. But that is an argument worth having. So, uh, yeah, I like again this this falls into the I don't want to make comments about this. I'd rather make a video than more people can see it. But the this chronic under under underestimation of the defensive uses of gun. Uh, self-defense of gun uses um, is is the foundation of almost all of these arguments as are r really I, I'd say naive views on the, the, the dangers that tyranny could exist and could pose and and how we would react to them like we're, we're gonna sue we're gonna sue if there's if Hitler comes to power and it's weird too where we have the same people who are telling us we should ban, ban guns and that we should trust the government and that the government uh, can't be tyrannical are very often the same people who are in a separate debate, maybe even that same day, saying that Trump is the next Hitler. Um, or and, and there were people who said that you know that Bush is a fascist or whatever. Well, okay, if you can't you can't call the one Hitler and then say we can't we don't need to worry about potential tyranny. Um, and I think they'll they'll switch between the arguments and then say, oh no, I didn't. I was just being hyperbolic when I said he's he's just not he's not actually the next Hitler. But fair enough, I don't think he is either. But the next Hitler could come, and 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 or some American version of Hitler that wouldn't. Ex I think that's a little lazy to just say Hitler when it could just be any type of tyranny. Um, you know, and you know, political oppression based on gun rights is actually a thing in the United States. Uh, the first gun laws in the United States were prohibitions against blacks and slaves owning guns. Or those are the first gun laws. And then some of the second gun laws were mandates for citizens or heads of household to own guns to be able to take part in the militia. This is going back to colonial periods. But prohibitions against blacks have a very long history through the colonial period, through the antebellum period. Even up until relatively recently, uh, a lot of gun regulations at the state level were designed to prevent blacks from getting guns. I, I've related this story before, um, but uh, famously in Michigan, where I'm from, which is you know not a uh, historic slave state, um, the state instituted what they called a safety inspection of all handguns. Uh, you needed to get a permit to purchase a handgun, and then you would need to bring the handgun into the local police station, and they would do, do a, quote, safety inspection. And actually, the first handguns that I bought, I had to do this. Um, but And I, I even joked, oh, did I pass a safety inspection? And the safety inspection was a pretext for two reasons. One, to register all the guns. Two, if you were black, your gun would fail the safety inspection, and they would confiscate it. Not when I bought mine, but in the past. Um, and anyone who's kind of interested in that, there's a great story in um, Malcolm X's autobiography. He grew up in Michigan, and he talks about that, how um, uh, state workers were coming and looking for guns constantly from his parents, um, from his father specifically. And they didn't mind, it's interesting, they didn't mind if he, they had rifles. They didn't want them to have handguns. Um, so there's actually a history of this in the United States of, of, of banning firearms from populations that want to be, that are targets for systematic political oppression. Um, and this is the, the argument, you know, this is like the paramount argument for gun, gun rights people is we need to have gun rights to prevent that sort of thing from happening. Look at this abuse. Gun control people tend to 
characterize gun restrictions like that as not being gun control. They've had long, long debates, and they did a whole video on gun control in the Second Amendment, and the argument was always, look, when, when the Third Reich bans Jews from having guns and confiscates guns from Jews, that's not gun control. That's just political oppression. Gun control would be like a ban on everybody, but since they're selectively enforcing it, then it's not doesn't count as gun control. No, that's that's completely stupid. That is ex exactly what gun control is for. It's always selective, right? They never disarm the police or the military. So, um, yeah, I'd say that's pretty much probably it. And there will probably be more videos about this. I know I did a series on gun control videos when I first started, but that was seven years ago. This issue has come back with a vengeance. Um, so I will probably continue to make videos on this topic and others. So I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.